Hello everyone, my name is Maggie Brown. I'm so excited to be here, even if it is virtually. Today I'm going to talk about something that affects you and me every single day. It affects what we do, it affects how we think, it affects every single aspect of our lives. And that thing is intelligence, or our perception of our intelligence, our definition of intelligence. Based on how intelligence is commonly perceived today, I'm kind of stupid. I've never been good at science or history, I've always struggled with reading comprehension, and I'm dyslexic. Throughout my entire academic career, my grades have always been purely mediocre. I want to talk about the negative effects that our societal and cultural definition of intelligence has on people's personal growth and self-confidence. As a society, we have a terrible definition of intelligence. Society says there are certain qualifications one must meet in order to be categorized as smart, and only a small group of people with the perfect combination of talents and abilities meet these qualifications. These are things like achieving high grades in science, math, English, and history in grade school without having to work very hard, being placed in advanced classes as a child and teen. It's things like how many simple multiplication problems you can do in a minute. Do y'all remember those timed tests we had to do in elementary school? They'd give us a piece of paper with 100 multiplication problems, and we'd have to fill out as many as we could in a minute. The kids who could finish were definitely Harvard bound, but the kids like me, who would get stressed out about the timer and only finish 15 problems, were destined to be old cat ladies or one of those people you see on reality TV. But the list also includes things like going to an expensive and well-known college and a job that requires a college education. These things all contribute to the snap judgments we make. It determines whether or not we put someone in our mental smart box or dumb box within the first moments of meeting someone. After all, first impressions are important. I mean, hopefully not that important, since the first thing I told you was that I'm stupid. But we spend so much time worrying about others' impressions of us. Have you ever thought about the snap judgments you make of other people? To experiment with this, let me show you the resumes of two people. Person one. In elementary school, they were placed in advanced classes. They had a high school GPA of 4.2. They were accepted into the University of Chicago, where they earned a bachelor's in computer science. In college, their GPA was 4.0. They earned a PhD in computer science from NYU, and they are now a professor at Oklahoma State University. Person two, in elementary school, they were placed in regular academic classes. In high school, they graduated with a 2.9 GPA. They earned a bachelor's degree in dance at Wake Tech, and they graduated from Wake Tech with a 3.0 GPA. They are now a part-time dance coach for high school students. Which one is the smart one? You know, don't you? I have only shown you their academic and working careers. You have never met them. You have never spoken to them. You have no idea what their life is like. You don't even know that they don't even exist because I completely made them up. But you don't have to know that, do you? In today's world, we only need this much information to immediately put someone in our mental smart box or dumb box. Traits that have to do with someone's academic success should not be the only things that qualify someone as smart or dumb, because limiting the defining traits to just these creates a cycle that every other person who doesn't fit the bill falls into. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I call it the cycle of intellectual doom, TM. When someone subconsciously categorizes someone as dumb, they begin to treat that person differently, whether they mean to or not. Then that person begins to believe they're unintelligent because they're being treated as such. This causes a change in behavior that evidently brings about negative results, feeding right back into that perception that they're dumb. My experience is the perfect example of this. It started in elementary school. I was just like everyone else in that I was extremely worried about what other people thought of me. Specifically, though, I was worried about what they thought of my intelligence. I was most self-conscious about this because of my weird position in school. See, my grades were slightly higher than average, so I was placed in the accelerated classes. However, I had the lowest grades of the higher classes, and I was always struggling. I got really good at copying other people's answers while they weren't looking. So good that sometimes they were looking. I would do everything I could to make sure others thought I was smart. And this resulted in a constant fear of being discovered as an undercover dumb person. There is almost nothing more disheartening than nodding along to a conversation or lesson, pretending to understand when internally you are confused, lost, and scared because asking for help would blow your cover. 
I remember the day when I realized that other people were putting me in their mental dumb box. My friend and I got in an argument about her little sister's homework and she finally snapped and she said, Maggie, I know I'm right. And I think I'm smarter than you, so. My whole world came crashing down. And from then on, I convinced myself I was dumb. I figured that's what everyone else thought of me, so it must be true. This attitude followed me into high school, causing my grades to be lower than they could have been, and almost stayed with me into college. I would always tell myself my grades were literal proof of my unintelligence, when really, my grades were proof of this cycle. But who am I to say I am unintelligent? Who are you to say you are unintelligent? Who is anyone to say that anyone else is unintelligent? Knowing how amazingly complex humans are and knowing that our minds are constantly growing, constantly changing, how naive is it to compress a person into such a small, limiting category? To do that, in my opinion, is the unintelligent thing. This is why I agree with the theory of multiple intelligences, which says that there are different kinds of intelligence someone can be. Howard Gardner, who brought this theory to light in his book, Frames of Mind, identified seven different kinds of intelligence. These are linguistic intelligence, logical or mathematical intelligence, musical intelligence, kinesthetic body intelligence, spatial visual intelligence, interpersonal intelligence, which is having the ability to properly detect and respond to other people's emotions, and intrapersonal intelligence, which is having the ability to self-reflect and be self-aware. Of course, it is impossible to make a definitive list of the different ways people can be intelligent since, once again, people are so complex and ever-changing. But these seven at least provide a little bit of insight to this idea. Look at this list. Of all seven, the only ones that are recognized by today's society as qualities of a smart person are linguistic intelligence and logical mathematical intelligence. Let's go back to our two resumes, remember those? But specifically, let's talk about the person that we thought was the dumb one of the two. In order to do what they do as a dance teacher, they have kinesthetic body intelligence, musical intelligence, spatial visual intelligence, and linguistic intelligence. They have the ability to vocalize movement, and that's hard to do. That is almost half of the different intelligences. It would be really easy for someone like our second resume person to get caught in the cycle of intellectual doom. If they only look at what society tells us is important, like I did, they would probably categorize themselves as dumb, like I did. But if we as a society stop looking at our small, limited list and look closer to see what each individual has to offer, we would realize that the list is actually much, much larger. And smart means a lot more than we think it does. So, what now? I decided to give this TED Talk because of how desperately passionate I am about this topic. And because of that, I'm not going to stand here today and simply lay out a bunch of problems without presenting a solution, of course. So where do we go from here? I could go on a huge rant about how the grading systems in our schools are flawed, because they are, or how today's media and society promotes a twisted and degrading definition of intelligence, but I won't. I won't because even though I believe that if we all work together, we can fix it, right? I know it's unrealistic to provide such a romantic solution that is purely based around hope. No one here can individually change our society because no one here can individually change our culture because no one here can individually change our history. But you, as an individual, you can change the way you think. I stand here today as living evidence that the cycle can be broken, and I broke it by changing the way I think. Instead of thinking, I'm stupid, I started thinking, I'm not there yet. And instead of getting down on myself about the things that I didn't do well, I started appreciating and applauding myself for the things I did do well. A life that is led by what society thinks of you is no life. But a life that is led by your own thoughts, your own opinions, is much more uplifting. So make those thoughts and opinions good and see in yourself what others may not be seeing. Choose to define your own intelligence as opposed to society defining it for you. Break the cycle and then help others do the same. <laughs>